on April 21, 2021. Indonesia's Navy submarine, KRI Nangala 402, plunged into the Sea of Bali during a routine training exercise. All 53 crew on board were confirmed dead. The 44-year-old vessel was found days later at the depth of more than 800 meters, split into three parts. The tragedy is Indonesian Navy's worst peacetime loss and one of history's deadliest submarine disasters. The Nangala is 44 years old. Usually the older a submarine, the riskier it becomes to operate it despite uh, routine maintenance and routine overhauls. Satu sisi bahwa ini kan kecelakaan, tapi kan namanya kecelakaan tentunya salah, uh, bisa saja dihindari ya. The loss of Nangala 402 has put into question President Joko Widodo's vision to turn Indonesia into a global maritime power. Whether it's submarine or aircraft or anything, readiness is important, is key. So I think that is why the event of uh, the accident of Nangala, I would say, give a lot of lessons uh, you know, for Indonesia. Indonesia today faces challenges on multiple fronts. Among others, illegal fishing, transnational crimes and terrorism. It also has to safeguard its territorial integrity and maritime sovereignty against an increasingly assertive China. Can Indonesia rise up to the challenge and realize its maritime vision? After years of neglect, can Indonesia restore the glory of its once proud naval force? April 25th, 2021. It was a sad day for Indonesia following the death of all 53 crew of a sunken submarine, Nangala 402. The submarine went missing during a routine torpedo drill in the Bali Sea in the early hours of April 21st. But it was declared a few days later that the lost submarine had sunk, cracked open, and broken into three parts, killing all 53 crew members on board. Brasilia Fernanda lost her husband, first electrical communications officer sergeant Rusti Ansha Raman, barely a month after she gave birth to their first son. It's also just a few months before they were due to celebrate their first wedding anniversary. Sajan Rahman died with 52 other crew members of the ill-fated submarine. Distraught and devastated over the death of her husband, Grisilia has vowed to stay strong for the sake of their son. She described her husband as a national hero who lost his life in the line of duty. Saya bangga sebenarnya sama suami. Dia bertugas dengan ikhlas meninggalkan saya dan anak saya yang masih bayi tapi insyaallah saya ikhlas karena di sana dia bertugas dengan baik menjadi pahlawan bangsa But Grisilia and the other family members of the sailors of the stricken submarine had to endure an excruciating wait for news about their loved ones Indonesia deployed more than 20 vessels in its search effort after the German-built submarine did not respond to several calls and failed to resurface. Rescuers were racing against the clock to find the Cold War-era submarine and its crew before the oxygen supply ran out. Ten countries, including Singapore, Australia, China and Malaysia, were also involved in the search and rescue mission. Segala upaya terbaik pencarian dan penyelamatan telah dan masih akan kita lakukan. Untuk itu, marilah 
Semuanya kita memanjatkan doa dan harapan terbaik bagi 53 patriot terbaik menjaga kedaulatan negara. But all hopes were dashed when it became clear the submarine had plunged more than 800 meters to the bottom of the Bali Sea. It broke into three parts, taking the lives of all the crew as well. Early findings suggest that the, the submarine was not uh, operating at its full capability. For example, I understand from the Indonesian Armed Forces uh, that an underwater radio that was supposed to be performing uh, during the exercise uh, was not uh, working optimally, yeah, according to a packing list that I, I got. And at the same time, they did not pack uh, the required equipment, for example, oxygen candles. So I can't say for sure if these are contributing factors uh, to the accident, uh, but I think uh, these are factors that needs to be looked at uh, in a comprehensive uh, investigation of the accident. As a nation which historically prides itself of being a maritime and trade power, the sinking of Nangala submarine had come as a shock to the people. The typical life cycle of a submarine is between 30 and 35 years. But the German-made submarine was built way back in 1977 and was acquired by the Indonesian Navy in 1981. The big question is, why was an aging 44-year-old submarine still in service? Was the old submarine getting pushed to the limit? Was it a disaster waiting to happen? I think one of the, one of the issues with the Nangala was its uh, problematic maintenance back in 2012 when it was supposed to be sent to South Korea in order to undergo a full overhaul. And there were a lot of issues regarding that of which I, at, the, at the moment, we don't know, we don't know enough about, but I, thought, I think this could have been prevented by having you know, stronger accountability, stronger transparency, and at the very least, uh, the, the results or even the summary of the results need to be conveyed to the public so that there can be also, you know, the, the, the officials that are doing this can be held accountable. The sinking of the submarine has exposed flaws of Indonesia's military assets and their hardware maintenance. And the accident involving Nangala submarine was not the first. The submarine's seaworthiness remains an issue, even though it was deemed safe for use right through September 2022. Nangala is a German-built boat uh, that was very advanced for its time. Yeah, unfortunately, the boat is very old and it has undergone through very dubious uh, upgrades in the past. So it's a German-made boat, but because of funding issues, uh, they had no choice but to upgrade uh, a lot of the vessel systems in South Korea instead of with the original manufacturer in Germany. So imagine if you were to buy a high-end high German car, for example. Yeah, okay, uh, uh, it was a, it's a good performance car, but when it's time to upgrade the car, you send it uh, to lower cost countries for upgrades in South Korea, for example. So I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't disparage anything about the South Koreans, but I think you can imagine that there might be some uh, issues of compatibility uh, in system equipment, for example. And that came up actually in about 2012 when there was a fatal incident uh, on Nangala during an exercise uh, involving its crew where there was three fatalities. James Goldrick joined the Australian Navy in 1974 and retired in 2012 as a two-star rear admiral. He says submarines require considerable investment in the equipment and the training of the crew. And crew members who have detailed knowledge of how to handle every system on the vessel to help them better respond to emergency situations. A submarine is a very challenging environment. They've, um, inevitably, uh, if they're very confined, um, you have a group of people who are working at very close quarters all the time. The sense of whether a submarine is in danger all the time is what I would say it's working in a hostile environment all the time. Um, and it's analogous to being in space. So you need very high engineering standards, um, you need very high maintenance standards, and you need a crew who are masters of all their systems um, and understand uh, how to operate them and of course how to react in emergencies 
and there's very little margin for error. The fact that we need this, that we need a tragedy like this to serve as a wake-up call, I think this is, uh, this is just, this is wrong. Okay? This is wrong that we need to have such a tragic accident uh, before we finally start talking about this. In fact, there were, the warning signs were already there. Um, and so what I think is, yes, this might serve as a wake-up call, but in the long run, will this really have uh, an, uh, that, that effect on, uh, on, on, on defense planning uh, in, in the future? For the families of the 53 sailors who perished in the tragic accident, the pain of losing their loved ones is simply hard to bear. The government has promised to provide full scholarship to the children of the crew members of the ill-fated vessel. But that has done little to ease the pain. Until today, 33-year-old Berda Asmara could still recall her last conversation she had with her husband, Guntu Ari Parsetio. The 39-year-old sergeant had been sailing on Lengala for 10 years until the tragedy struck in April this year. Itu video call. Itu tadi bilang kan, eh, mas sangat terbina. Itu, ya, tak tahu akan nanti hati, ya, tu yang cepat pulang, ya. Kapan rencana pulang saya bilang itu. Ya kalau enggak hari Sabtu, hari Minggu, seperti itu. The sinking of the Nangala is a grim reminder of the risks facing the crew navigating through the waters on board an aging fleet. But what's stopping Indonesia from modernizing its naval forces to protect its vast archipelago? Is it due to a dearth of funds or a lack of political will? Joko Widodo unveiled his vision to transform Indonesia into a global maritime nation back in July 2014, upon assuming power as Indonesia's president. More than just a desire to develop the country's marine-based economy, he also had a vision to turn Indonesia into a global maritime power. But seven years on, has this vision been achieved? Every day, 42-year-old businessman Murdani brings staples such as rice, cooking oil and other basic essentials from Indonesia's capital Jakarta to the westernmost province of Aceh, nearly 2,500 kilometers away. He says transporting the goods these days has become a lot easier and faster since President Joko Widodo launched the Sea Toll program in 2015. Kalau manfaatnya itu oh, dari tolong untuk memberi kemudahan kemudahan untuk para apa pelaku-pelaku bisnis yang ada misal di Aceh apa mungkin di Jakarta yang bisa untuk mengirim ke daerah-daerah yang seperti harga freightnya itu lebih murah dibandingkan mungkin dengan harga freight komersial lah, dengan di luar dari subsidi yang kita bilang ini tol laut yang selama ini saya tahu semenjak tol laut mungkin tidak ada hambatan untuk proses sandar sesuai dengan ini kan untuk perjalanan untuk muatan semua on time lebih kurang kalau perjalanan lebih kurang 4 atau 3 5 hari lah jalan dari Jakarta Tanjung Priuk ke pelabuhan Malayati Kerung Raya The Aceh chapter of the country's port operator PT Palindo says sea toll serves two ports in the province and has proven to be beneficial for the locals Konsumsi ataupun kebutuhan juga masyarakat di Provinsi Aceh ini juga masih bergantung dari Pulau Jawa ataupun tetangga provinsi, tetangga sebelah dari Medan. Sea toll is one of President Joko Widodo's visions to bring prosperity to the world's largest archipelago. This is done through better connectivity among the various islands in Indonesia. Under the sea toll program, prices of commodities across the country will be more or less equal. 
In other words, there's no price gap between commodities brought in from the more developed western part of the country to the less developed eastern regions of Indonesia. This will make the delivery of goods to every island in Indonesia a lot easier and more effective due to lower distribution costs. Apart from its economic dimension, Mr. Widodo is also the first president in democratic Indonesia to publicly promote a maritime security doctrine. Maritime defense was overlooked for more than three decades during the rule of former President Suharto. His new order government preferred the army to deal with internal security threats and help him stay in power instead of spending money to boost the country's naval presence. Walaupun sejak kemerdekaan 45 sampai sekarang, memang kita hanya sebagai negara negara kepulauan yang masih inward looking. Karena pada kita kan memang betul anda pertanyaan tadi struggling kita masih banyak persoalan-persoalan di dalam negeri baik itu bagaimana pembangunan manusia, pembangunan ekonomi dan juga banyaknya kegiatan apa namanya politik ya. Jadi selama itu apa kegiatan politik kita uh, uh, contohnya adalah uh, berbagai uh, kejadian separatisme, konflik sampai tahun 65 uh, kan Anda ketahui bahwa banyak sekali pemberontakan PRRI, Persmesta dan lain-lain dan IDI sehingga kita fokusnya pada uh, fokus dari musuh di dari dalam sehingga itu inward looking. Begitu diambil alih oleh uh, orde baru ternyata paradigma tidak berubah. Justru begitu masuk Ordo Baru uh, yang dimana dikuasai oleh Angkatan Darat, nah dengan terutama dengan doktrin di fungsinya, fokusnya kembali ke in inward looking gitu loh. Long term military modernization efforts only began during the leadership of Indonesia's sixth president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono. And under Joko Widodo's presidency, that effort looks set to continue, or so it seems. Now into his second term, is Widodo's maritime vision finally taking shape? Global Maritime Fulcrum is just a vision for the future. It doesn't really change uh, the pre-existing foundations of Indonesia's uh, maritime outlook at how it views itself and how it views uh, the external world. At best, it did, uh, what it did was it pushed the, the idea of a maritime Indonesia into the public mainstream, which generated a lot of interest. And I think that's a good start. Arif Havas Ugrosino is Indonesia's ambassador to Germany. He was the deputy minister for maritime sovereignty at the coordinating ministry for maritime affairs from 2015 to 2018. He has led numerous bilateral and regional negotiations on Indonesian maritime boundaries, extradition efforts and international security framework. He says the current pandemic has hit Indonesia's economy hard and that has forced the government to review its national priorities. We did not develop that fast, of course, uh, because of the budget issue. Now especially that Many of the budgets are being redirected for COVID, you know, but we have a very clear plan. And um, I think uh, we have also uh, developed within our own law and regulations on defense that uh, we have to fulfill our minimum essential force, for instance. We have MAF 1, 2, and 3, uh, and hopefully 4, but of course, we have this uh, pandemic situation, so that's why things need to be reanalyzed. We have new fact from the assumption. The assumption was we will grow 5%. Uh, the fact of the matter, we are not growing at 5%, for instance. You know, the GDP is going to shrink. So there will be a lot of uh, macroeconomic assumption that we need to revisit. President Widodo's maritime vision is captured in the country's ocean policy. Among others, it plans to strengthen the Navy to ensure better control over outermost islands, improve law and enforcement at sea, protect Indonesia's rich marine resources, and facilitate sea transportation to remote islands. 
Independent research analyst Teola Allen has spent five years researching on Redodo's maritime mission. She feels that while a lot of progress has been made in the area of port infrastructure, the same can't be said about the nation's naval capabilities. The vision has seven pillars, but the main ones are maritime economy infrastructure, maritime resources, uh, maritime defense and security, and then there are other elements like, you know, maritime government, maritime diplomacy, maritime culture, and so on. And because the vision was announced during his campaign, uh, many people question, you know, if it was only a campaign rhetorics because he was running for presidency, or was it a real vision? And in 2021, how has it turned out? You know, how, how has been the progress? And I would look at two dimensions. The first is maritime infrastructure and maritime economy. And the second is maritime defense. I would say that in terms of maritime economy and infrastructure, there has been actually quite a notable improvement. Starting with the maritime economy, there has been around 100 new ports under the program. And there is also a program called the Seaport that is actually quite um, successful. But in terms of maritime defense, the progress is much, much more limited. I mean, it's true that we do have limited budget, but we also have not optimized the small budget that we have. So I think one of the main problems is there is a lack of clear planning and priority. Um, there is lack of clear blueprint. There is a lack of commitment to stick to any blueprint. Jokowi has done well to articulate the vision of a maritime exist with an emphasis on the Indonesian Navy. However, at this point of time in his second term, uh, I would say that not much has been done uh, to meet uh, the, the goals that were in, in part of his uh, victory speech when he was uh, made president. Uh, a lot of the naval programs are running behind schedule, uh, actually. So some of the surface combatants, uh, they were projected to have a class of eight frigates uh, around this time. Uh, that, is, uh, that, that target is actually very much behind in schedule. Uh, they were supposed to have about eight submarines by now. Uh, as we know, uh, that is also unfortunately behind schedule. So I think a lot of the goals that Jokowi articulated uh, in his original Maritime Exist goal uh, has not been met, unfortunately. Defence analysts say naval modernisation has encountered a number of problems, such as limited resources, rudimentary upgrades and budgetary constraints. Indonesia's defence budget has almost quadrupled in the last 20 years, but the figure is still less than 1% of GDP. The current defence budget is only about 0.6 to 0.7 percent of GDP, uh, and I think this defence budget falls uh, very far short uh, when compared to the kind of security requirements that Indonesia is facing at the moment. If you were to look at countries uh, in the Middle East, their defence budget are as high as about four to five percent of GDP, and given the threats that uh, Indonesia is facing uh, at the moment both from conventional threats in terms of you know, state on state conflict and the threats of separatism uh, from their territories which are claiming independence, for example, uh, and also the threat of uh, maritime piracy and maritime terrorism. I think this defense budget has definitely uh, room for expansion. Widodo's maritime vision has yielded some results to connect faraway islands in the vast archipelago but his dream to transform the Navy into a regional power will require considerable political will and support, as well as huge financial resources. Will the government be able to meet its own goal to modernize and expand the Navy? Sampai Jumpa, or Till We Meet Again. Those are part of the lyrics of a popular Indonesian song. It was recorded by the crew of Nangala 402 just two weeks before they left for duty. Sadly, the Portland video which they did 
turned out to be the sailor's final farewell. The vessel that they were in sank more than 800 meters below the surface of the ocean, killing all 53 crew members on board. The tragedy has renewed calls for Indonesia to modernize its aging naval forces, and that includes the extremely vital submarines to help boost the nation's defense and safeguard its national sovereignty and territorial integrity. The submarines are extremely difficult to detect and very powerful weapon systems. That means that they uh, constitute a threat to any other maritime force that's trying to operate in the vicinity. So in terms of um, protecting your maritime um, approaches, uh, submarines are extremely useful. I call them elsewhere the apex predators of uh, maritime warfare. Uh, and, and that's true because if you have a submarine, you do have the ability to influence what the enemy will do uh, from the start. The accident off Bali has cut the number of submarines owned by Indonesia to four, barely enough to patrol and protect the vast archipelago. The current fleet is well below China, which has more than 50 submarines, and Japan with 21 units. In terms of primary combatants, the Indonesian Navy currently operates a fleet of four submarines, uh, 10 frigates, 21 corvettes, and in addition to this, the Navy operates a mix of about 120 smaller patrol craft, patrol boats, and uh, auxiliary vessels. So while it possesses these capabilities, you know, uh, combatant cap capabilities such as submarines, uh, frigates, and patrol boats, the service still very much lacks the capacity to cover the very vast, extensive, ec exclusive economic zone that Indonesia claims especially around uh, the South China Sea. So the deterring and defeating of a well-armed uh, conventional force uh, is a very daunting task. Back in the 1960s, Indonesia's navy under the country's first president, Sukarno, was the envy of its neighbors. It operated 12 state-of-the-art whiskey-class submarines acquired from Russia. The diesel-electric attack submarines were highly advanced at the time and possessed long-range missiles which could reach targets as far as Australia. Back in the days of Sukarno, we had the largest submarine fleet in Southeast Asia and there was a certain pride that was attached to having the largest submarine fleet in Southeast Asia. Um, however, after, uh, after Sukarno and after in subsequent administrations, the dream of having a large submarine fleet sort of uh, faded away. Uh, these days, it's not the question of whether the, in, of Indonesia wants a big submarine fleet, but rather whether does it really need a big submarine fleet. The answer here is that, well, Indonesia requires the, the minimum essential amount of submarines, which has been uh, the case since the Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono administration. In 2005, former Indonesia President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono introduced a 20-year plan to revitalize the armed forces. The Minimum Essential Forces, or MEF for short, aims to equip the armed forces with around 270 vessels, 10 fighter squadrons and up to 12 submarines by 2024. It was conceived against the background of a rise in the militarization of Southeast Asia. For example, before 2000, uh, there were practically no submarines in Southeast Asia. Uh, besides Indonesia. And then after that, uh, the Singapore Armed Forces, or rather the Republic of Singapore Navy, uh, commissioned its first submarines in 2000. Uh, and then after that, uh, the region became uh, very armed uh, with a proliferation of submarines from Malaysia uh, to the Vietnam, and now Thailand and the Philippines. So uh, under the original minimum essential force, yeah, the Indonesian president then projected a minimum number of 12 submarines by 2024 that could cover the vast archipelago across the three time zones. 
nearly two months after Indonesia lost one of its submarines. The Ministry of Defence signed a contract with an Italian shipbuilder, Fincantieri, to supply six multi-mission frigates for the Indonesian Navy. The financial details of the contract, however, have yet to be disclosed. The Jokowi government, uh, through uh, the Minister of Defence, Pak Prabowo Subianto, has just signed a deal uh, for eight uh, frigates, uh, um, uh, six frame uh, type and two refurbished uh, from the Italian uh, 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 armed forces. So I think this is a good progress to add into uh, you know, the maritime capability of Indonesia. Um, so I would say that uh, Indonesia is making progress slowly, uh, but of course I don't see that Indonesia has the capability to achieve the minimum essential force. In terms of uh, the minimum essential force, right, I don't see that Indonesia can have 12 submarines uh, by 2024. When a contract is signed, does not mean that the contract is confirmed. Okay, we have seen the Indonesian uh, Ministry of Defence do this uh, several times in the past. For example, they signed a contract for a squadron of Sukhoi 35 uh, fighter aircraft from Russia. Uh, however, that particular contract is currently uh, uncertain because uh, Indonesia and uh, the Russian company, they have not sorted out the uh, payment terms. So the particular uh, contract where we are talking about with the frigates is also in the same manner that the contract has been signed, but it's not actually in force until funding uh, from the program is available. Another obstacle facing Indonesia in its future procurement efforts is the law that requires Indonesia's involvement in the production of such military assets. This again has put into question whether Indonesia will be able to secure more submarines by 2024 as planned. Unfortunately, uh, because of this defence procurement law that makes it compulsory uh, for the purchase of major military items is compulsory for uh, at least a part of uh, the production capabilities to be done in Indonesia. Uh, and the Indonesian uh, military complex at the moment, they don't have the sophistication to take on some of these uh, building works. Okay, you got to understand that building a submarine is very different from building a ship. Okay, there's a lot of pressure house to be composed. So the Indonesian industry at the moment is not able uh, to undertake such a complex shipbuilding process with the exception of state-owned shipbuilder PT Pal. So in a way, that particular ambition of 12 submarines by 2024 has been curtailed by this law that makes it mandatory for, uh, for a contractor to produce part of the submarines in Indonesia. So we are currently way behind uh, the goal of 12 submarines by 2024. But maritime expert and Indonesia's ambassador to Germany, Arif Havas Ugrosino, says in spite of all the limitations, the country is still proud of its defence capabilities. And um, we have built uh, planes ourselves and we have exported Indonesian uh, planes to uh, the Philippines, Senegal, Nepal, Thailand. So we actually export. We have the uh, uh, cap capability of our defense industry. With Nepal, for instance, in Surabaya, we, we have uh, ability to develop uh, sea lift vessels, uh, landing platform dock. Okay, we have exported that uh, to uh, the Philippines and in Africa, remember when we when we export a naval hospital, we have our own naval hospital built by ourselves. Uh, we send, uh, we sell to the Philippines and we export to the Philippines and we export, I think, to, to um, Africa. And with the Pindad, of course, uh, we build, uh, you know, armed vehicle, movement personnel, small arms, our small arms by Petit Pindad is built coming out of FN, and FN is NATO standards. We have uh, ANOA used for the UN uh, peacekeeping operations, uh, 24 in Sudan, 20 in Lebanon, you know, uh, four in Central Africa, 20 in Congo. So yeah, this is Indonesia not being ready. We build uh, our own warship. But with China's growing territorial ambitions in areas surrounding the South China Sea, 
the pressure is on for the government to modernize its naval force. Indonesia has also found itself under increasing pressure amid the continuing incursions by Chinese and Vietnamese fishing vessels into its exclusive economic zone. Faced with these growing threats, will the government finally step up to meet the challenges? You are in Indonesian waters, sir. Please move away and go back to your territory, sir. Yes, sir. Please move away and go back to your territory, sir. It's a scene that has become all too familiar in recent years. Chinese vessels entering into or conducting illegal fishing in Indonesian waters off the Nantuna Islands in the South China Sea. The strategic waters have become the center of a long simmering dispute between several countries, including China, Malaysia, Vietnam and the Philippines. Although Indonesia is not a claimant state in the dispute, it is concerned with Beijing's inclusion of the resource-rich Natuna Islands within its self-proclaimed Nine Dash Line. And that includes as much as 90% of these waters in the South China Sea. China has claimed that the waters of Indonesia's northern Natuna Islands are its traditional fishing grounds. That prompted President Joko Widodo to make several visits to the Natuna Islands to reassert Indonesia's authority and sovereignty over the territory. So the Natuna Islands are actually Indonesia's front door when it comes to the South China Sea. Now, in the hypothetical case that conflict breaks out in the South China Sea, it will be um, the, the Natuna, the Natuna Islands will be where um, some of the fighting may occur. And that's why Indonesia is very much concerned about increasing its presence and overall um, its defenses in the Natuna Islands. There are also other uh, issues that Indonesia faces of a non-military nature, and this is related to Indonesia's limited capacity to patrol its waters and borders. This includes threats such as piracy, armed robbery, um, human trafficking, drug smuggling, transnational crime. Kembali, kenapa Natuna jadi hot? Karena Natuna ini luar biasa. Kenapa luar biasa? sumber daya alam, ya. jadi di bawahnya itu banyak minyak, di atasnya banyak ikan. Nah, makanya kita sebagai saya khususnya Bakamla Denes ini sebagai simbol-simbol negara harus selalu hadir di sana untuk menjaga bahwa eh ini wilayah gue loh, jangan macam-macam gitu. Illegal fishing is estimated to cost Indonesia around 3 billion US dollars a year. Protecting the country's sovereignty, therefore, has become a matter of Indonesia's national interest. In addition to the Navy, two agencies play equally important roles in protecting Indonesia's waters from intruders. Tugas pokok Bakamla adalah melaksanakan patroli keamanan dan keselamatan di wilayah perairan dan wilayah yurisdiksi Indonesia. Jadi kita punya kewenangan mulai dari wilayah teritorial sampai ke ZTE. Makanya kita sering mengamankan di perbatasan-perbatasan, sering bertemu, sering ya agak ini dikit lah dengan Coast Guard Cina, dengan Coast Guard Vietnam, khususnya di daerah-daerah yang masih grey area di sini, yang masih belum putus atau belum clear untuk masalah bordernya. Ada delapan permasalah. Nah, cuman yang sering terjadi di sini masalah IUVC. Ya, kemudian ada trans international crime juga ada di dalam situ karena bisa mencuci uang, bisa perbudakan di dalam situ juga. Nah kemudian juga ada masalah pelanggaran kedaulatan atau perbatasan. Tapi kemudian ada invasi itu yang kemungkinannya sangat kecil lah. Bakamla and the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries each has a fleet of around 30 vessels. Both institutions acknowledge the need to expand the fleet 
and replace the aging vessels. So far in 2021, the Ministry has captured more than 100 illegal and foreign fishing vessels, mostly from Vietnam, Malaysia and the Philippines. In BLS, I'm sure I have 70, almost 77. If I Perhitungan saya berdasarkan analisa ancaman itu sekitar ya 78 sampai 80. Ya. Nah ini juga masih proses, jadi saya setiap tahun ini nambah 3, 4 kapal ini masih proses terus. Apalagi sekarang dengan situasi COVID kan ya mungkin pemerintah lagi fokus ke, ke itu. Kita juga paham betul lah masalah ini. Jadi kita juga ya agak legowo di sini agak gimana gitu. ya demikian. Tapi kalau dibilang kurang ya kurang. Tapi bu bukan berarti kita terus diem saja atau tidak berbuat enggak. Justru dengan kurangnya ini, saya berpikir bagaimana bisa mengisi kekosongan-kekosongan tempat-tempat yang rawan. Ya, saya lebih meningkatkan sinergi saya dengan teman-teman angkatan laut, dengan teman-teman KKP, polisi, sehingga kita bisa saling bergantian ngisi kekosongan-kekosongan itu. Yang 60 persen karena usia nah, sudah turun speknya. Dan menurut saya udah nggak layak gitu. Udah nggak layak lah, jadi ya akhirnya untuk menindak sulit. Kalau mau jujur, yang 60 persen kita gunakan untuk nakut-nakutin aja dah. Itu kita terbuka saja lah. Jadi kita berharap idealnya minimal 70 kapal. Minimal 70 kapal. Nah, untuk menutupi ini kekurangan yang kita miliki, karena laut ini kan bukan milik PSDKP ya, milik bangsa Indonesia milik semua elemen-elemen pemerintah Republik Indonesia. Jadi kita bersinergi. For now, protecting Indonesia's territory remains a top priority, especially in the light of China's growing territorial ambitions. Indonesia's significant economic and military ties with China, however, could pose a huge dilemma for Indonesia. On the one hand, it wants to send a strong signal to China that it means business. On the other hand, it does not want to jeopardize the growing ties between the two sides. China is one of Indonesia's largest foreign investors. In the first half of 2019, its investments reached 2.3 billion US dollars, constituting about 16.2% of the total foreign investment in the country. It's also one of the main suppliers of arms to Indonesia. So I will describe Indonesia's relationship with China as one that is very complicated. Yeah? On one hand, we have the dispute around the waters of Natuna Islands, where Indonesia is trying to get rid of the Chinese fishing vessels that has been encroaching uh, into what it considers to be its uh, traditional fishing ground. Uh, but on the other hand, Indonesia is also depending on China as one of its major weapon suppliers. Yeah, for example, a lot of the warships in the Indonesian Navy today uh, are armed with the C-802 missile from China. Uh, and a lot of the sensors that are found uh, on some of the Indonesian warships today are also sensors that are made in China. Uh, on top of that, the Indonesian uh, Marines uh, actually rely on uh, one of their major uh, anti-aircraft guns is also, is also made in China. So I think the, the relationship between Beijing and Jakarta is very complicated in that sense. Um, you know, it's just always a struggle between uh, the need to maintain territorial sovereignty in the South China Sea with the need to maintain uh, friendly trade and military relations uh, as part of the maritime access uh, vision. The recent sinking of the 44-year-old submarine Nangala 402 and the deaths of all 53 crew members on board the ill-fated vessel has triggered debate about the state of Indonesia's naval force. In spite of its expressed vision to upgrade and modernize its military assets, budget shortfalls, coupled with the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, has frustrated efforts to achieve its vision of becoming a global maritime power. Will 2021 be any different Will it finally be the year when Indonesia puts its maritime policy into action? Is this maritime vision too unrealistic to achieve, at least for now? 
Yeah, I think that there are still reasons to be optimistic. The Indonesian Navy, although a lot of the programs are behind schedule quite significantly, uh, but they have acquired some modern surface combatants in recent years. For example, the Sigma class frigates uh, that were commissioned just a few years ago, are some of the more advanced uh, surface combatants in this part of the world. Uh, the Indonesian Navy is currently in negotiations for a lot more frigates uh, from Denmark and Europe. And if these programs materialize, uh, this will be the most sophisticated and the most advanced frigate uh, in Southeast Asia. So I think there's a lot to look forward to uh, in terms of the modernization of the armed forces. Although in the near term, uh, a lot of programs seem to be behind schedule. To say that we are not in the right track, or we are not ready, then the question is ready for what? So we are not ready, but we have arrested and sunken over 400 foreign vessels. That is in the state of not being ready. Huh? Uh, and also, don't forget, we are the only country in Southeast Asia, or even South Asia, East Asia and the Pacific, that sent our Navy as part of the peacekeeping operations of the UN. We actually sent warships uh, to Lebanon. Uh, our frigate is in Lebanon. So it's, uh, I want to combine that. You know, I want to combine those assumptions who say we are not ready, but in that state of being not ready, we send our frigates in the UN peacekeeping operations. We manage to uh, stop illegal fishing in our waters. We managed to arrest 400 foreign vessels entering into our water. Now that is in the, in the state of not being ready. Imagine if we are ready.